Hello, welcome back to DEI Matters, Conversations with Margaret Credo Thomas. It's been a while since we've been here and I am so excited today because I have three of my peers who are DEI directors joining me today for our, we're gonna have such an amazing conversation. So I am gonna let them introduce themselves and after they introduce themselves, we can start with the first question, but I wanna say welcome to everybody. Thank you for being here. So Jessica, can I start with you? Can you just tell us your name, what district you're from, and a little bit of how you got into the role? Sure. So my name is uh, Jessica Boston Davis. I'm the Director for Equity and Excellence in the Somerville Public Schools. Um, so just not too far away in Somerville. And, um, you know, I have a longer story that I, you know, can tell about what led me into this, into this work to begin with. Um, but the short story is um, I was completing my doctorate at Harvard and uh, finished my last year of my doctorate with the Somerville Public Schools, um, working with the school committee around creating an equity policy. And from that policy, we kind of developed a role, the role that I, that I ended up um, you know, taking, taking. So that's how I ended up there. Who would have thought your doctoral program led you to your, your, your job that you're in? Yes. It's great. And then we have Manuel. I've known Manuel for a long time. So Manuel, can you tell us who you are and a little bit about yourself? Manuel Fernandez, Chief Equity Officer for the city, uh, excuse me, for the Cambridge Public Schools. Um, what led me to this position is I was a principal in Cambridge for 10 years and we did a lot of equity work and the um, former superintendent felt that uh, we needed an equity director soon. And uh, so I was appointed interim and um, took on the role in uh, last June and um, was appointed permanent um, uh, chief equity officer last week, so. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And last but not least, Kathy, yes. can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is Kathy Lopes. I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Newton Public Schools. And my path to this position really began um, early in my career as a school social worker um, and working many years in education, uh, thinking clinically and structurally about the education system. I also, for the past 11 years, have been an adjunct professor uh, teaching courses around race and oppression and policy. So I ended up uh, merging all of that into this role now. So. Oh, that's great. So you all have diverse backgrounds that brought you to this position. Um, I am, I've known Kathy for a couple of years. I've known Manuel for a lot of years. <laughs> and I've just met Jessica because we're in a same group. Um, and when I thought about having you all on and just creating questions, one of them was that as I am seven months into this role, one of them was um, what are some of the um, successes that you all have met with thus far since you've been in your role? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, I've been in my role now, um, closing in on my second year in this position in Newton. And I think that one of the things that we're really proud of is we've been able to uh, come together and create a collective statement about our commitment to this work that we now use across the board. It's, it's, it really grounds all of the work that we are invested in, in equity, and it was a collaboration of different um, roles throughout the district and different voices, and it's something that we all can default to and say, this is why we're doing it, and here are some ways to think about what we're doing. So I think that was a really proud moment for the district for us to just solidify solidify our work in, in a statement that, um, that we hold everyone accountable to. I'm glad I, what I heard you say is that, and then you ground, that statement yes. is grounding the work that you're doing yes. going forward. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. For me, um, I think the, as a principal, the thing that drove me to be, I think, a better principal over time was listening to young people. And many of the initiatives that we launched while I was a principal in, in two schools were really driven by what students said they needed. And so when I took on this role, I, I, I actually did have to 
go back and forth. So where do I begin? How do I start? What do I do? And what we decided to do is knowing that I had the row in March and it didn't begin until July or June, late June, I was able to work with some people to gather the voices of young people and do like a listening conference with young people over a series of um, events. And um, at the end of that, that, we asked them, would you be willing to work with us on launching a summit to talk about young people's concerns? And so uh, we worked with them all summer long, and then in September, September 25th, they um, facilitated, 15 young uh, high school students facilitated a summit of high school students talking about what does equity look like, feel like, sound like in the Cambridge Public Schools. Mm. Beautiful day. One of the most, you know, in, in my career, uh, one of the most uh, heartwarming things for me. But more importantly, the outcomes from that work have informed the work of the district leadership, the principals, and so on. It's also, we've, we've mimicked that process with caregivers, with the LGBTQ plus community. We'll be doing the same with the educators. Um, uh, of color, and so that um, all of that, all of those initiatives have brought us more and more uh, information and a fresher perspective mm -hmm. on what the community needs around mm -hmm. equity. What I appreciate what you said about that is that you had listening sessions, and from those listening sessions, you actually put some things into action because I feel like sometimes we have listening sessions and we all we did was just give somebody story and we put Check our notes off. yeah away in the, in the in the drawer. And what I appreciate is that from those listening sessions, you had some actionable steps that included students because we have these jobs because of students. So. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's, a, that's really exciting. Um, I think mine is similar. So I think there are a lot of areas where I f I'm so proud and um, feel like we've been really successful in the work in Somerville. Um, this is now uh, rounding off my third year in this role um, in Somerville. And so, I mean, as I think over the years, through the pandemic, um, I think it was really, uh, you know, some of my most proud moments were just bringing together stakeholders. I mean, from school committee to students to community members, families, um, you know, educators, administrators, um, coming together, working on plans together. We created things like an advancing equity task force, mm -hmm. um, which was a diverse group of stakeholders that came together to um, name the success areas in equity in equity and name the inequities mm -hmm. within our system mm -hmm. um, and work together to tackle those things. So there's so many things that, that my mind goes to, but I think for this year, um, similarly, um, centering the voices of students is kind of core to who I am and core to why I'm in education to begin with. Um, and this year we launched a student advisory council and so this is a group of 18 young people um, who are fired up. I'm excited because they are being compensated for their time. Oh. They're earning credit for their time. Mm. And they are, they, um, we did a youth participatory action research project. So essentially they created a survey. They distributed it throughout our district, um, got feedback. And from that data, um, now they're analyzing the data, disaggregating it, but from that data they are Similarly, um, identifying areas that we need to prioritize. Mm -hmm. um, so we just had a listening session with our superintendent, with mm. their principal. And in, in those moments when um, I think about what do we need to create the conditions, to create the container in order to allow students to kind of thrive and lead and create the communities and spaces that they want and need and deserve. Um, so when I think about the work that that group is doing this year, that, that kind of brings me a lot of joy and pride in the work uh, that we're doing. So similarly, um, that student-centered, and, and, and along the same lines, the kind of community collaboration yeah. has been one of my um, highest points of success, yeah. certainly this year. That's just amazing, the student council. and. So they, they, you actually empowered them and you are actually giving them some power to do some things and do some changes and it's not just the adults doing that. That's great. Um, my next question to everybody is what are some of the challenges 
Um, and we had we were having a conversation before we started about the N word. I know that has been a challenge, um, and it's probably been a challenge for you all. Um, and what are some more challenges that you might have faced since being in this position? I mean, there there are many challenges in this work, which is why we have these positions and, and need to really expand this work across the board. I think that if I had to think about like some kind of areas of challenges, one of which is just there's so many priorities. There's so many ways to enter this work and really trying to break it down to um, you know, what's feasible, um, what has to be done over time, what do we have to build to get this forward. There's, there's urgency and pressure from one direction um, and then, and then um, another direction. So I think using the community, using student voice, really understanding like what are the highest needs, what, what can we tackle here, what do we need to do first. And for me, I really push on the self-critique and the self-awareness and the self-exploration as to how do you show up. Um, how do you maybe participate mm -hmm. in harmful systems? Mm -hmm. What do you need to disrupt in your own practices and mm -hmm. behaviors? And that can be really hard when you have a community that's just saying, well, tell us what to do. How do we mm -hmm. fix this? And when my response is, you need to stop and, and really do some internal work first and see where you are, where you are in this um, and what role um, is best served by you mm -hmm. as an educator in the classroom or a leader in the school community or a parent. Um, you know, that speaks on behalf or represents other parents. So I would say trying to negotiate and navigate mm -hmm. all of the, the wants and the asks from all the different stakeholders mm -hmm. and all the community members is, is a challenge that, you know, you, I still have to finagle through yeah. constantly. I, I heard you said something that I've been saying. It's, it's, the, it's the reflection that you have to do in mm -hmm. order to do this work, in mm -hmm. order to do the adaptive work, right? In order to do the, the change of the mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and stepping into this role, I feel like people are like, okay, so you're here, now this should change very quickly. And right. I'm like, well, this person might've been thinking this way for the last 20 years. So mm -hmm. you, there's those several conversations that you constantly have to have or activities that you have to have in order to help someone to, like you said, be introspective of right. this work. Yeah, it's yeah. really important. And there's so many systems that really support this this process, this way we have been doing things. So it's also, you know, it's, it's not overnight work. We have to look at how we participate and what systems have reinforced yeah. some really harmful things that we, we we benefit yeah. from. Would you like to go next? Sure, I'm, I'm happy <laughs> to. Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, I would just underscore, double click everything that Kathy shared. Absolutely. Um, I feel all of those things um, similarly in my role. I think um, for me, I mean, the prioritization is so, such a big thing. I mean, even just me personally, I'm like, you said, you said when you started, where do I start? Like, there's all these things going on, where do I start? But I think the biggest challenge um, for me is how do we, um, as a system, make sure that equity is not extra? Mm. It's not an extra thing. It's not, um, you know, we do our, we continue to do the way, thing, we continue to do things the way we have, and then we think through a lens of equity. In fact, it should be, the way we are looking at everything. Mm -hmm. It's not a separate checkbox. Mm -hmm. um, and so what's hard is if you've been doing things for this way for your entire career, suddenly you have to shift um, and consider something that you haven't necessarily always done. Or, I mean, there are many people within our district um, that have been leading for equity before equity you know, the, la the language equity was out. So there have been many people who have been doing it kind of on their own, but um, as we think about building a department mm -hmm. and um, joining everyone's team meetings mm -hmm. and things like that, um, you know, it's, it's a shift in practice, which can be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, even if people are willing to, to lean in and, and are excited about the role um, existing and, and, and because of the work that will come out of it, it does require a shift in practice where equity is not extra. You know, right. we're not asking you to create an extra plan. Right. You know what I mean? It's actually we're act, act, asking you to think through the plan that you've already created mm -hmm. through a lens of equity. Yeah. Um, we're asking you to look at the data that you've always looked at. Right. 
through these different, <laughs> asking yourself these different questions. We're asking you to engage with families in the way that you always, you know, you've always had these meetings mm -hmm. with families, but in what ways should you be mindful of and what can you mm -hmm. shift? So that's been like one of the bigger things along with prioritization mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I continue to grapple with and continue to think, how do I make sure I frame things in a way that feels like it's not an extra kind of right. burden, but it's just the way right. we do things. Right. It's embedded. Mm -hmm. Equity is embedded in everything that we do, That's and it right. lives in everything that we do. That's yep. right. Embedded, yep. not extra. Do correct. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. I would, um, I think, I would agree with everything that Kathy and Jessica have said, and I would tell you that you could do another hour mm -hmm. show just on the challenges of, of this work. Mm -hmm. um, my superintendent speaks about from the very beginning, she said equity would be the through line in everything that we do. Getting there is really the, the, the challenge, the journey. And for me, it's, I, I live, I mean, excuse me, I work in a community that is, um, possess, professes to be, you know, very uh, woke and very progressive, very, um, uh, clear on its expectations of uh, equity and, and inclusion, but so much of what it's done, in, at least in the 10 years that I've been there, has been transformative, excuse me, has been performative. Mm -hmm. And getting people to move from performative to transformative is, is the problem, particularly if the, I contribute to this, I, I do this, I do that, I do this, and what, what has changed? Mm -hmm. Nothing's changed for, uh, meaningful for the kids or sustainable for the kids mm -hmm. and ultimately that's why we're here we're not here for any other reason like you know the the challenges of equity and inclusion and race and everything in our society uh, are so mammoth that um, no one person no one institution can solve all the world's problems or just this country's problems in that regard so you focus on your own sphere of influence and in doing so you look at what can you move from being something that we say we're doing to something that we can see that we've been doing, mm -hmm. that we see the outcomes? Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the challenge right now, is creating outcome-based solutions and initiatives, going from the, the, the technical to the adaptive to make sure that the changes that we make have, have, have impacts on the lives of young people, mm -hmm. um, where they go, what, you know, um, where do they go to college or where do they go after high school? Um, how successful are they or can they be? Um, as opposed to, you know, we give kids sneakers, we give kids uh, all these coats and things of this sort. Every year we feel good about ourselves because we've done that, but every year we're giving the same kid a coat. Um, and, and we're giving his kids coats. Um, what is changing? No, the system isn't changing. And so we're really working hard with all of the educators, the school administrators, and even caregivers, having caregivers say, this is what I need if it's going to make a difference in my life, and having kids uh, sell us the same thing, and then have educators and principals and others administrators working together to say, how do we stop doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same result? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we can't work. keep doing it. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. So my challenge is getting people who think that they are doing the right thing to say, okay, can you can you make that transformative yeah. instead of saying, let me put this on my Facebook, let me put this on my bumper yeah. sticker or, yeah. or on my bumper. The or sign in the, in the yard. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, how do you break the cycle is what I'm hearing you say um, and not have us feel good about <laughs> yeah. that we did. Mm -hmm. Like I said, have, I, I put the sign in my yard and I always say, you put your sign in your yard, however, what if I wanted to purchase a house in your community? Mm -hmm. would, would it still be the same or now would it change because now you might feel, uh, you know, I'm bringing down your property or things like that? Early, early in my career, I had, um, as a MECO uh, director, um, I had a teacher say to me that we don't have any problem with the black children. I mean, we have some issues with, with certain groups of people, but they're not the black people, you know. And I said, well, those certain groups of people, they live here, right? So if these 120 kids get off this bus every day, if I tell them, you're going to live across the street now, you're going to live here, is that going to make a difference in this community? Mm -hmm. 
sure it's going to make a difference in this community. And so one of the reasons why I used to say to him that we don't have a pro you don't have a problem with these kids because they go home every day, mm -hmm. okay, to another community. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get folks to understand that? Like one of the things about Mexico communities, as a former Mexico director, and uh, two people here who've been who work in Mexico communities, is I've always said that the children who live who go to school in these public schools are all Mexico students. Because if you take the Mechel program out, regardless of how entrenched it may be in any one school or another, you take it out, you've changed the entire mm -hmm. school district, mm -hmm. okay? And so when people begin to look at how these kids bring change and how we all benefit from it and start working towards making this universal and not just a, a temporary program that runs from September to June and, and ends at you know five o'clock for most kids, um, does it looks like diversity? Does it look like inclusion? Mm. Does it look like belonging? Does it look like transformation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you like you said, Manuel, we could be here for several days having this conversation. Um, you you mentioned something that segues into the next question that I have for you all. And being seven <clears throat> months new into this position, so all of you all have been in your positions two three years. Um, Manuel, this is your first year and you've been doing this work. So I, I kind of look at you <laughs> in that manner of been doing this, have been doing this work. Um, where would you tell somebody to start? Cause that's where I was kind of, and I still was, I'm still kind of like, okay, equity lives everywhere. Where am I supposed to go? And I'm, I'm a department of one, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> that could be a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, what would you tell somebody who's just entering in this position? Where would you tell them to start? Go ahead. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, you have you have to understand the community you're in. So there has to be a process of incess of assessment, of listening, of learning, of really getting a sense of again who are the stakeholders, who are the adversaries, where does power reside, what is the makeup of your community, who are the leaders that are moving this work forward, and how do you bring them in? I think. One of the biggest mistakes a district can make when they create this position or they bring on even a small department is thinking like that is your work, mm -hmm. you go do it. I really see myself as a facilitator for the entire school community. Um, that um, I really partner with school leaders as a consultant and help them build capacity to then go on and do this work in, in their specific um, relevant roles. So I think that really understanding the, the, the makeup of, of the power um, the, then you begin to prioritize. But I, I work with um, students in terms of student um, engagement and efficacy and agency. I work with leaders in helping them think about how they're training um, their staff when they're meeting with their staff, what's the work and the conversations that they're pushing on their staff. I work with parents who will say, like, come speak to us. I'll work with a few of you, help you understand, and then you go back out into the community and, and use that and build coalition around this. So I really see myself is kind of a, a mover and a facilitator of this work and not the holder, not the keeper of this work because that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So if I was to be removed from this position, I want to hope that the district still has an understanding of what their responsibility mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So um, I think really supporting the, the person in this role or the people in this department to have access mm -hmm. to all the different components of, of, of this work and all the people who can carry it, um, but not leave it on them. That You have to understand that they're there to help you grow and help you build your leadership capacity, to help you understand the makeup of your school and see it in a way that maybe you haven't before, but that this work is for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and that for those who are interested in doing this work to really understand or to, to ask those questions when you're going to this. What's the support going to look like? What's the participation going to look like? What are your expectations of me leading this work mm -hmm. and how, how can we partner? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and Everything you said I agree with. Yeah, this, that was great. I'm like, hmm, what do I need to go back <laughs> and do? Uh, yes, so I agree with all of that as usual. Um, I would say, you know, uh, you, I was thinking about what you were just sharing because I the last meeting I left my district before coming here, we had a I had a conversation with a, a director in in in, um, in central office, and we asked ourselves, what is different in the student experience? So just to your point, 
now that we've had several years, we're, we're talking about adding positions into the department, we're talking about budget, we're, you know, all of these important things. And so the question for us as we were thinking through this is, what is different about the student experience? So I share that to say, um, to build off of your kind of getting to know very deeply the community, the stakeholders, um, all, in every kind of corner of your community, um, I would also say like, what do the students experience? Like really, what is their experience? How are you shadowing students? Are you interviewing students? You know, I started with a lot of focus groups mm -hmm. um, and I still do, I will be doing listening tours even in the spring, going to every, every school, both for students and for staff, but really thinking, I wanna know deeply what the student and when I say the student experience, of course, there is a wide diversity yeah. within that. Yeah. Um, and I want to get to know that. What nuance do we need to know? You asked, you said, you mentioned about the power dynamics. Where do you notice power mm -hmm. dynamics and, you know, be it formal or informal? Mm -hmm. um, those would be all the kind of questions I would ask myself if I were to start it again mm -hmm. or to give advice to someone else. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think that's probably where where I would start. From there, um, as you get to know, one other dis uh, one additional thing that I'll uh, I'll add is, you know, we talked a little bit about technical versus adaptive. So mm -hmm. technical being you know the structures and the systems, and adaptive being more mindset um, shifting. And one thing that I think is helpful to start is to think about in order to do more transformational adaptive work what needs to be true about the systems and structures. You know, you have to have some technical in order to move some adaptive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in listening um, to, to the community, in getting to know the student experience, the student experience, the <coughs> diversity amongst it, think I um, tried to think a lot about what structures need to be true um, in my district in order to advance equity in the way that we, we saw the vision to do so. So um, that would be the other place that I would start. And, you know, I would start trying to see where do we build the structures? Mm -hmm. What structures need to exist? What check-ins need to happen? What mechanisms need to be you mm -hmm. know, in place in our district in order to kind of advance through some of the adaptive work? As you say structures, mm -hmm. how do you know, so what structures need to be uprooted? I always think about yeah. too, right? When you say that we need to have these in place in order to do the adaptive work. And I know for me, I don't want to put another structure on something mm -hmm. that is being a hindrance That's right. to students. And so I know I've been thinking about um, how do you uproot, right? Mm -hmm. What is an obstruction to students being successful. Um, and um, I know one thing that I did was uh, mm -hmm. district, I'm doing a district equity audit. Mm -hmm. um, I've done the focus groups and I'm just feeling like we also need to do the audit to understand what our strengths are and to also know what are, so, what are those like barriers, right? Um, and I think it's a lot of us know and sometimes it's people want data. So I'm like, okay, so we're gonna give you data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think that's the other thing about when you talk about structures, we also have to think about what we need to uproot and what people need to let go of in order to uproot those things mm -hmm. needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, um, I wanna go back to the original part of the question because both Kathy and, and uh, Jessica answered um, very thoroughly, and I have nothing to add to that portion of it. It was really talking about, you know, the, the, the DEI person looking outside of themselves and seeing what needs to be done and what do I need to get this work done. I want to focus on that person and what it means. See, I, 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 I benefited from my years of experience in taking this job that in, during a transition where we had one superintendent leaving and another one coming in, that there was no, um, what do you need, Manuel? What do you want? Mm -hmm. There was no onboarding in the sense that, um, one, it was a new department, it was a new concept. Who, who knew how to onboard me? Um, and I wasn't a, a, you know, I wasn't a youngster. Mm -hmm. I had been around in, in, in education for a while. So I think, but, but saying that for like the first 30 days, I'm going like, what? What, you know, where do I zero in? Where do I, what do I, and it took me a while. And, and one of the things that I clearly have benefited from in my life is thought partners. And so I had a lot of people 
uh, some I brought on and some that um, that I knew. Um, I hadn't, um, I barely knew Jessica. I hadn't met Kathy. I, you and I conferred throughout the summer. Mm -hmm. and, and so at one point, um, I felt comfortable walking in my shoes on this journey. But there were people who enter this work. They need mentors. They need thought partners. We meet monthly with, with others across this, uh, the region. Um, that is so helpful. Um, many people look at me and think, well, he's a veteran. He's been around. I benefit from that as much as somebody who just started this work um, and the only job they've ever had. So the, the whole idea of having um, a direct connect to the superintendent, you don't have to report to the superintendent. I get that. You know, with all the people that work in the superintendent's office, they might have to limit. But I don't want to be delayed three weeks trying to get an answer to an issue that needs to be resolved if we're going to really center equity. Um, I need a, I need a, I need a mentor when I'm, particularly when I'm young. And if I'm not young, not young, but new to the work, if if not a a, a mentor, then um, a thought partner. If not a coach, a thought partner. A group like this and. Um, this is lonely work often, particularly in the case of some of you who are the only person in your position. You, you close the door and it's just you. And you're like, you're the only one talking and thinking 24-7, equity, 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 equity. And everybody else say, well, what's the curriculum going to look like? And if they don't have the through line that you talked about, then, then, then um, we don't have, um, those, they don't have those same type of conversations. It's like, Again, equity comes up like Black History Month. Oh, it's February. We have yeah. to say something about black people. Yeah. Um, so it's so very important <laughs> that, that um, like I said to a group recently, my, my friends at Nellie May, we've got to wrap our arms around each other and hold each other tight through these tough roads because it's, going, it's, it's about to get tougher, I think, as we, um, as we have any success in any of these communities in centering equity then we're going to find that there are going to be a group of people who don't like that. They're, they're fearful. And I do my best to, to meet and, and, and respond to some of their concerns. But some things don't, they don't relish a response. That's not the word I'm looking for. They, they just don't deserve a response, okay? They, they did not from me anyway. They might deserve a response from somebody else or something else. So anyway, I do think about, um, um, I had a young uh, principal call me recently, just a quick aside, doesn't, doesn't work in my district, was referred to me as someone just to talk to, and here's this young woman, she's a, black, a young black educator, uh, a principal, new to the area, doesn't have a lot of friends or colleagues here, um, and, and found herself being asked to leave. Uh, we'll pay you for the rest of the year, but you're pushing wow. equity too hard and folks wow. and folks wow. are really getting nervous and stuff. Wow. Only black adult in the building. Um, that happens every day mm -hmm. to, when you're alone. So we need to make sure that if, if the number one thing for me, anyone coming aboard, is who do I talk to? Right. Who do I lean on? Who do I connect with? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I would yes. add, yeah, that's yeah, it's so, so important. important. Yep. Yeah, I, that was the first thing I said. I, um, I found a mentor who's outside of this organization <laughs> that mm -hmm. I need to be talking mm -hmm. to. I mm -hmm. think the other thing that's really important is that people need to get behind the DEI director. Your senior leadership needs to be behind that DEI director and supporting that director in this work because it's just like you said, Manuel. You're eat, breathing, and sleeping this, and you need to make you need to know that that senior leadership is behind you <laughs> because mm -hmm. this is this is all new. This is all new. So if people say they want it when it's over here, but and when they feel like you're taking away their power and their privilege. Right. Oh wait wait a minute, you're, you're doing too much now. You need to calm down. And it's and I always say to people, are you all really ready to do this work? Mm -hmm. Are you really committed to do this work? Because we're gonna unearth some things that is not gonna be ple pleasant. Um, and so I'm, I'm thankful that you said that, that that person, that person coming in, it's very important to support that person. And, and to check speaking. in on that person, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. not once a month. Yeah. Check on that person at least once yeah. a week or every other day and say, and just say, Kathy, how are you doing, mm -hmm. you know? And back to what you were saying about um, people, you know, your senior leadership and others who like, whoa, you're moving to. 
share with them the emails and the phone calls and the texts that you're getting from parents and children and, mm -hmm. and, and educators about the experience that they're having every day in our districts mm -hmm. where they feel marginalized, minimalized, mm -hmm. um, it just really not even considered when people make statements or, or, or issue uh, uh, directions, instructions or whatever and people feel left out of it and they come to you. Mm -hmm. What am I supposed to tell them? Well, right. you know, they're right. not ready yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Can I add one other thing to yeah. that? <clears throat> Which is the added layer, and this is a challenge and also kind of builds off of the make sure you check on your people and, and find your people. We are all people of color sitting up here. Mm -hmm. And one thing that, you know, we've all had many other roles in schools, this is the first role that I've had. I've been a teacher, I've been a grade team leader, I've been a coach, I've been a principal. This is the first time where my identity is completely mm -hmm. looped into mm -hmm. all that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So while I tend to, I think, I think you have to be able to do this well to do the job, I tend to be able to hold things object and not be subject to them. And mm -hmm. so when I hear a comment that, be a little bit racist you know I'm able to hold it I'm able to talk to a I'm able to you know and but there are those moments when we talk about black boys that I'm thinking about my two little black yeah. sons yes. you know there are yeah, those yeah. moments in a way that you know that you know some something will come out that really um, can be triggering mm -hmm. and it is unique to our role in that you know if I were thinking I mean, although if I were thinking about curriculum, I'd still be thinking about this, but let's just say, for example, if I were solely thinking about curriculum, for example, I may not always be implicated. I'm always thinking about oppression in a way that my identity may be wrapped up in, mm -hmm. you know, for example. So I think, um, you know, I, I share that to say, like, finding your people is so important. Yeah. Um, finding the people that are going to be your lifelines is so mm -hmm. important, both within and mm -hmm. outside of your district, as we've kind of found mm -hmm. each other. Um, because it, it is it is really hard to always kind of hold, hold mm -hmm. those things mm -hmm. object, because it's hard work, and sometimes it's like, when you said that, you know, I actually found myself feeling a little triggered, but you know, we have to, the work, right. the work continues. Yeah. It does, yeah. it does. I, I, saying all of this, what is like a phrase, a word um, that you stand on when those challenging times come? Like what, what do you remind yourself of um, that tells you, you know, I'm gonna get back up and do this? I think for me, I had heard this over, um, it was like a virtual training over the summer and I've been using it and I, I can't even credit where I heard it from, but um, it really is when, when it's challenging or you're getting pushback from a, a community member saying, that's too hard or we need to slow it down or we need to focus on this. My pushback is then who's being centered? Mm -hmm. Because if we say we're committed to being an anti-racist community, that this is action, this is actionable. It's not just a philosophy. Mm -hmm. And um, if we say we're about it, then we really have to commit to this idea of equity and this idea that all students are deserving of, you know, emotional safety in their learning mm -hmm. environment, of uh, a, a, a space where they feel like they are welcomed and that they belong, a space where they have dignity. So I think one of the things I always put it back on, like, if you believe that all students, it seems that you're prioritizing a, a, a subset of students mm -hmm. and not really considering through the equity lens. But the other is who's being centered. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I get resistance from educators saying, like, it's too hard to de-level a classroom well too hard for who are you centering kind of you and having to and I, I recognize that that is a shift that's undoing policy and practice that we've all been accustomed to but it sounds like we're centering kind of like your needs here and not the needs of e uh, equitable kind of access for all students uh, when parents say well I don't want this book in my child's classroom because my child well who's being centered your child who has been consistently centered as a member of like the dominant you know culture in our society society, well, we're going to decenter dominance and we're going to look at equitable access and opportunities for all students. So a lot of these challenges that come that are about we don't have time or we need to slow down or this is too hard or I don't, I, I'm all about everyone having this as long as my child still has access to, you know, everything that I've been able to resource and provide them. Well, then you're centering your path and you're not really about equity. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, 
that always, that default in my thinking when I'm challenged, um, that I, I put it out there, well, let's think about this because that actually doesn't benefit all students. That benefits kind of your purpose or your child or your instruction or, you know, your safety, your comfort, right? That's one that we always hear about comfort for everyone and we're creating spaces of comfort. Well, I walk as a black woman in spaces all day, every day where I have to adjust my level of comfort because these spaces aren't meant for me um, and they're not inclusive for me. So if we're going to decenter this dominance, it means that there are going to be moments where your comfort is not the priority in the space. Yeah. So I, I think for me it's, it's that question like, well, who are we centering in this conversation or in this pushback? Is it in the name of equity or is it in the name of self-preservation of what's comfortable and what's been a privilege yeah. for you? Yeah. It's being centered. I wish I could be as profound as that. <laughs> <Always. laughs> Mine was is simply this. Been here before, we got this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I won't even go, i tell you when I started my career in Medco, but I can remember having conversations there that, you know, um, some 20 years later, I'm in uh, Taunton and having the same conversations. And then next thing I know, I'm coming to Cambridge where I'm thinking I'll never have these conversations in Cambridge, mm -hmm. having the same conversations. And so, um, and they used to shake me as a young man. Mm -hmm. um, you might not remember, I used to have a little temper. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. Thomas. <laughs> I <didn't mean> it. <laughs> um, particularly, I mean, being the only black man in many of the um, um, districts, not just schools, but districts I worked in, every once in a while I just got angry, one, out of frustration, and two, I'm here, you know. Um, but as time's gone on, I, going on, I've, I've noticed where that has not been as helpful for me. Um, um, and I've had to be a little more um, flexible and, and nimble and, and I don't get upset anymore when people come to me with stuff that just seems so bizarre and so really uh, not only um, uh, inequitable but unethical and I'll just be looking, I've been here before, we got this, yeah. you know, learn from what I, what I did before. Yeah. Great. Um. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things that I tell myself. When I think about work being really challenging, I always think to myself, anything worth having is worth working hard for. Mm -hmm. um, so I always know, like, if it's worth it, it's going you know, to be hard work. But if anything worth having is worth working hard for, and that is something I always um, kind of repeat to myself. I also have my own sayings for myself. Um, like she is clothed in strength and dignity, mm -hmm. like a psalm. You know, I, I take, mm -hmm. you know, my scriptures and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a woman of faith. And so when I think about things like that, I'm like, anything that I'm going to do, mm -hmm. when it gets challenging, when people are starting to push back, mm -hmm. if somebody speaks to me in a way that I do not deserve to be spoken to, mm -hmm. um, which is few and far between, but when it happens, mm -hmm. you know, it happens. And I think any leader um, kind of experiences that. It's certainly people of color, um, women leaders. Um, and so I have to remind myself like who I am, mm -hmm. that I am the person for the role, mm -hmm. and that I um, am a strong and dignified person, like, in, in, you know, and in, in, in carry myself. And so I have those things like that written on my whiteboard, mm -hmm. right <laughs> on my mm -hmm. desk. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the things that remind me uh, to persevere mm -hmm. um, when it gets tough. Yeah, my girlfriend, um, gave me a frame that had the word joy mm -hmm. um, in the definition. And she was like, I need you to set this on your desk. Mm -hmm. um, because she knows that doing this work does bring me joy because I want to elevate students' voices. I mean, that is the goal for me, is that when I walk into a room, I, it's always who's not in the room, mm -hmm. and that I, now that I have a seat, and you know Michelle Obama says, "Don't wait, don't waste your seat at the table." I always think of that—that mm -hmm. that I cannot waste my seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And there are times that I have lost my voice because of being the only one and doing that street calculus of what are the mitigating factors that want that I should talk, and what are the risk factors That's if right. I do talk, right? Um, and so those are the two things that I always. Um, think about and so Michelle Obama when she says don't waste your seat at the table I always say Margaret don't waste your seat here 
because you're you're supposed to be here for this time. Um, and so let's let's do what you're supposed to do for this time, right? Um, so I like what everybody said is, I feel like we need to ask the, the group, the JAG group, like what is the mantra? And we need to mm-hmm. kind of put that yeah, together. That's, that's a great question. That, I mean, you, you know. just reminded me of the joy is a form of resistance quote also. Yeah. That's another one I yeah. use a lot. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to be, you know, yeah. be full of joy yes. and, and because this is, it's, it's good work that we're mm-hmm. doing. I, I, my last question was what podcast or book? However, I want to I want to shift it a little bit because I want to know what song really, mm-hmm. what song is okay. really feeding your soul? What, <laughs> what's that song? What's that song you get in your car and you're like, you know, I, I kind of wait until I get out of the driveway of the high school oh, and kind of bless and start, you know, down the street and start blessing. What's that song that you're like, yes. Well, the book I had, well, I'll go with the song real quick. There's one song that I really like when I want to get uplift. And I don't really know if this is the name of it, but it's, it's, it's a few years old. It's um, young brothers um, singing um, in the style of We Are The World, and it's called You Will Know, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's all these, um, you know, all the, mm-hmm. some of them have passed, Lavert and, mm-hmm. um, and others, um, but the, we're talking 90s. Um, um, maybe early 2000s, um, New Jack, um, mm-hmm. that, and it's just a collection of brothers, mm-hmm. must be about 30 or 40 of them singing in an auditorium, and it's to, um, when I was a young boy, and talks about, I had visions and dreams, mm-hmm. um, and telling, the song talks about, don't give up on your visions and dreams. Mm-hmm. So I love that song. And I loved it so much that when I was a principal, my music director had the students sing it one day um, mm-hmm. at, a, at an assembly as a surprise for me, oh, and it was beautiful. Nice, mm. nice. But I'm still going to tell you my book. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm rereading a book that I wrote, or read maybe 15 years ago by James Baldwin. It's a collection of his essays. It's called The Price of a Ticket. Mm-hmm. And I, I have the book. Um, and my daughter works for Beacon Press, and they just published the book again, so it reminded mm. me of the book. So I just, um, I actually bought the audio book version. Oh, okay. um, so um, I've been listening to it as I drive um, to and from work, when I drive anywhere. And in fact, it's, it's, it's like 33 hours long. So, oh, yeah. um, but it's just, uh, James Baldwin, I think, was just, uh, he, the man, his vision, in his his understanding, there's his his um his piece a talk to teachers, mm-hmm. which um I think is Every in this year, book I'm not sure, that. but yeah. a talk to teachers and I, and, and Jessica I I was teaching a class um at, at UMass Dartmouth, uh, graduate students and I gave them that assignment, mm-hmm. and <clears throat> their analysis of it and critique reflection was due, literally which I did not know on the day. Um, like I think it was like 30 years after it was written. Oh wow! Wow! To, to the day. Wow! Okay, wow. but wow. that that right wow. there, you're right. Bring wow. it out every year. Every share year. it with everybody. That's right. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Um, I don't know if there's a particular song. I think I'm just really drawn in literature and music. I'm really drawn to like strong black women and black feminists. So, you know, when I, I want to get hype, anytime I hear Who Run the World by Beyonce, like I get hype, right? No matter where I am, that song just feeds me. Um, but I, I love music by, by strong black women who are just out there being authentic to who they are. So I get really um, hype and excited when I hear these really powerful voices or these lyrics from these women who are just owning, you know, their blackness and their strength and and how they show up so I don't know if there's a specific song but that music I'm just really drawn to uh, when I think about books also in literature I, I my the first book that changed my life was the autobiography of Asada Shakur mm-hmm. and I'm always drawn to books by black feminists mm-hmm. and Brittany Cooper mm-hmm. and um, Nicole Hannah Jones 1619 okay. project mm-hmm. I just um, revisited all about love by Bell Hooks yeah. following her passing yeah. which yeah. Um, you know is, is still really grounding in yeah. the why 
why is we do yeah. this work and how do we do this with yeah. compassion? And I also, um, I'm gonna begin, I'm waiting for it to arrive, um, reread the autobiography of Angela Davis. Uh, mm. It came out on her birthday and anniversary with a new introduction. Mm. So I think it is really important to go back and reread these things with a new mm. lens, right? Having a, mm. a different understanding of life years later and going back and reconnecting mm. to the things that like set my soul um, into this work. So we, were, we had to read Bell Hooks in my doctoral mm. program. It's like it's forever. Yeah, it's right? forever. It's yep. forever. Mm -hmm. Jessica. Yeah, I mean, all of these things. <laughs> that Baldwin piece, I'm, I'm actually probably going to go back and read it, um, you know, tonight or tomorrow. Um, that is excellent. Okay, so for music. Uh, I immediately went to Beyonce. Mm -hmm. There's, I, I recently, I just this past weekend did a long road trip and I was listening to both Solange, A Seat at the Table, mm -hmm. which, uh -huh. you know, we yes. might as well yep. since we're talking yep. about it. That is just, <laughs> yep. uh, you know, it was one of those albums that you can just listen to every song. Yeah, every song. Um, so that, and then Beyonce's, um, you know the soundtrack she made for the new Lion King mm -hmm. movie? Mm -hmm. Some of those songs are very powerful. Yeah. Like there's one called Power. You'll never and the chorus is like, You'll never take my power. Mm. And um anyway, that, I think that and there's another one called Find Your Way Back. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of talking about and I hope I'm I hope I'm saying this right because I need to go back and think critically of the lyrics, but this is just off the top of my head. So I think it's about, you know, the messages that the world tells you who you are, mm. find your way back to who you really are. Mm. And it, it is just a great song. So maybe we'll add that to our playlist yeah, and play it uh, to, you know, yeah, at, at the start of at the start, start of our yeah, next play some yeah. songs at our dad meeting. Yeah, yeah. and I, I kind of wanna go back and, and and think through closer my book list because these Books were all really yeah. powerful. I was just thinking know. about, you know, we. I recently read, you know, um, uh, my grandmother's hands, mm. oh, oh. Um, which Brilliant. which was yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. It was it yeah. was really good, and yeah. and there are questions. There are also parts where I'm like, hmm, interesting. I don't know if I fully agree, but I think a book is a good book when I continue to think about it, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even you know. So for, for everyone listening, the, the book is about um, generational, what happens when you pass down trauma mm -hmm. from generation to generation mm -hmm. and the way in which it lives in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so I, and it shares practices like humming, like rocking, mm -hmm. like tapping. And I've done them myself. I also did them with my sons. Mm -hmm. Like I have little babies. Yeah. Sometimes when they're really overwhelmed, I'm humming and tapping yeah, yeah. and it works. Yeah. And so it's just yeah. really, so I guess that's that's the text that I, that I have in my mind uh, most recently, but. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I'm inspired because I need to go back and, and get something a little, even <laughs> even even meatier. So, um, I know for me, um, uh, the song that like really gets me reson that resonates with me and gets me hyped is Alicia Keys. This girl's on fire mm. um, because there are times I need to play that mm -hmm. for myself and um, and anything Kurt Franklin for me. Mm -hmm. Um, is something that helps me also. Um, as for my reading right now, is doctoral, like I'm reading <laughs> articles, right? And so it's like, it's interesting because um, my um, superintendent is um, right, um, reading, um, I think it's called Sweetgrass. Um, I might be getting the title wrong. And she's like, I need you to read this book. And I'm like, yeah, when am I gonna find time for that <laughs> kind of thing? So I'm waiting for the summer. I have a pile of books that I'm really waiting to dig in. And then you all have just given some other titles that I'm like, yeah, I wanna go and we like James Baldwin and we read some mm -hmm. things. Um, I feel like we need to put a like book list yes. together yeah, for our group I because, started. yeah, cause that was just like, just asking yeah. you all that. I'm like, oh, what? I wonder what else our group mm -hmm. is really reading mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what songs they're listening to mm -hmm. also. Um, thank you so, so much for um, you all taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm so thankful that it worked because <laughs> I know everybody's schedule is really, I know when I look at my calendar, it's just like somebody's like, can you meet? And you're like, uh, yeah, in two weeks. Uh, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm hoping that maybe we can do this again, maybe bring a couple of more of our peers in um, mm -hmm. and really talk about, really go even deeper into the conversation of the of DEI and what does that mean for our departments. Um, so again, thank you for being with us. I'm glad that you can join us with um, conversations with Margaret Credo Thomas. Um, we hope to see you again. <laughs>